Eckhart saw hell, too. You know what he said? He said, the only thing that burns in hell is the part of you that won't let go of your life. Your memories, your attachments, they burn them all away. But they're not punishing you, he said. They're freeing your soul. So the way he sees it, if you're frightened of dying and, and you're holding on, you'll see devils tearing your life away. But if you've made your peace, then the devils are really angels freeing you from the earth. It's just a matter of how you look at it, that's all. So don't worry, okay? Okay? Happy heresies, and welcome to the desert of the real. This is AM by Gnostic Radio, broadcast from the virtual Alexandria, that state of mind where East meets West, through the God above God dead King. This is your incessant exploration of history's most feared mystics and artists, the Gnostics. This is also your incessant exploration of discovering who you really are, a digital Lucifer and delirious Donnie Darko. Before they made you forget and they made you a serf of the establishment. Like Gurdjieff said, Identifying as the chief obstacle to self-remembering. A man who identifies with anything is unable to remember himself. Aeon Bite Gnostic Radio is the chief place to lose all identification, your very identity, and come to that state of fullness of pleroma. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars. But we won't. We're slowly learning that fact. And we're very, very pissed off. I am and I am Abraxas, that terrible god up of God as the ancients knew him. And the fundagelicals fear him today. I come to you in my meat space incarnation of Miguel Connor. Broadcasting from the lawful and frigid dystopia of Chicago. Like Led Zeppelin sang, when the levee breaks, come to Chicago. The levee has broken, exposing the lies of Jehovah and his angelic union thugs. And we are swept away by the baptismal waters of truth and divine remembrance. Come to Chicago. My father, Lord of silence, supreme God of desolation. Though mankind reviles, yet aches to embrace. Strengthen my purpose to save the world from a second ordeal in Jesus Christ and his grubby mundane creed. I would like to make a few points before our interview. And what an interview it is, O oh, true seeker warriors. On this approximately August 16th, the year of our Demiurge 2014, we have the long overdue pleasure of having at the virtual Alexandria, Mark Gaffney, to discuss his foundational and spirit-provoking book, Gnostic Secrets of the Nascenes the initiatory teachings of the Last Supper. We mind the forbidden teachings of the serpent worshippers, as the Nassines were known as, who found so much liberation in the gnosis of the snake in the Garden of Eden, who they equated with Jesus or Sophia, and the kundalini energies that took the form of so many lunar deities that represented the lost wisdom aspect of the divine. Now you will have a chance to get that serpent gnosis and those kundalini energies. It's been a brilliant journey of self-awakening. Now you've simply got to ask yourself this. What is happiness to you? There is still a lot of debate about whether the Gnostics were fanboys of the material world. The short answer is, no, they weren't. 
Like Shakespeare said, life is a tale told by a fool, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. The Gnostics would agree, and that is the beauty of being a quote-unquote world hater in a philosophical slash mystic way. In the nothing is where you find everything, where you can finally see the hidden sparks of the first Sephiroth calling out to you. It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. Expanding on this, the Gnostics subscribe more than anyone to the two-reality paradigm and drew hard lines for important reasons. They used and weaponized mythology to represent existentialist truths about the nature of suffering and basically wake up, as Blavatsky said, your snoring divine spark. Manichaean texts, for example, are often horrible narratives, cosmic porn basically, describing the universe as being created by the menses and semen of archons. In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry and been widely regarded as a bad move. Yet, when it came to walking the walk, the Manichaeans were nature lovers, vegetarian, pacifists, and artists who wouldn't even walk on grass in order to avoid giving pain. Similar with the Cathars of the medieval ages. The only people who didn't love the Cathars or Manichaeans for what they represented were those in the government and ruling religions of different regions. And these Gnostics were crushed for this. Watch that kind of talk or you'll get your heathen head smacked! Well, that's very Christian. Believe what I say or I'll hurt you. Now nah, you're getting it! Is there a disconnect between the Gnostic walk and talk? I would say no. I would say that the prophet Mani would continue lambasting matter today. Because that is the only way people would get away from their smartphones, Facebook, Netflix marathons, Cafe Americanos, and so forth. And actually get on the streets and start helping the downtrodden. And maybe just paint or create something that is timeless. That's one reason the Gnostics were dangerous, because few today want to actually get down and do the work of healing the universe, healing the very scarred face of the lion-headed Demiurge. Mark Gaffney will certainly address this in our interview. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, the world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. Another point is that the Gnostics were basically apolitical in ancient history. However, we can glean what their politics might have been today. That is anarchism. I don't mean the common teen term relating to Sid Vicious, exactly, but the one closer to Noam Chomsky where the burden of proof is placed on the governmental, business, and religious institutions to prove why we should give up a single right, a single lambent flicker of our divine spark. The classic Gnostics place squarely the burden of proof on the gods and their servants, stood up to creation and asked, why should I be here beyond taking care of a sentient life next to me? Why should I fall into your broken down framework? Why? Why? People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. Like J. Krishnamurti said, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. I'll have more on anarchism in future episodes. I've always wanted to create a radical political movement called the Nowhere Men. 
so radical that even my family is against it. But more to come as the levy continues to break. Mankind has been trying to kill each other off since the beginning of time. Now, we finally have the power to finish the job. Lastly, please abandon the idea that Gnosis is direct experience with the divine. All religions use that in their PR. It's not original. Gnosticism, like Neoplatonism and Hermeticism, is actually very indirect experience with the divine. As one rises across heavenly spheres and arc on ruled dimensions, and descends through infected layers of personality until communing with the vast aeons. Gnosis is an acquaintance with the divine, as Elaine Pagels and Bentley Layton describe, a relationship and union with a primal intelligence that won't fry your brain but make you transparent to the transcendent, into a daemon in the flesh. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. Like the Corpus Hermeticum says very well, make yourself grow to a greatness beyond measure. Free yourself from the body. Raise yourself above all time. Become eternity. Then you will understand God. Oh, and the Gnostics, as Jeffrey Kupperman said in our interview on Neoplatonism, would never go, I'm spiritual, not religious, like so many say today. No, the Gnostics and Neoplatonists would actually say, I'm spiritual and religious and very intellectual. The divine light, the mythic rituals, and the sacred and profane rhythm to become a modern day Tom Sawyer is woven into the fabric of the cosmos for us to find. To truly have an acquaintance with the divine and full relationship with our indwelling son of man. Yes, these are bruises from fighting. Yes, I'm comfortable with that. I am enlightened. But remember the warning of Joseph Campbell. There is nothing worse than reaching the top of the ladder, only to find out you were on the wrong wall. Again, we have the great honor of having Mark Gaffney to discuss Gnostic Secrets of the Nessenes. Our interview ventures beyond these overlooked but important heretics whose message is more relevant than ever as the levee breaks and we come to Chicago. He lied to us, Trinity. He tricked us. If you would have told us the truth, we would have told you to shove that red pill right up your ass. Please support Aeon by Gnostic Radio in any way you can. A few shekels here and there, any assistance you might have, like marketing, design, or procuring virgins for sacrifices to Moloch. Please don't forget to support my Patreon campaign, where you donate every time I produce. And together, we can continue growing one of the greatest heretical communities in the history of the multiverse. Just visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, dadcam, slash, aeonbyte. Or check out the banner at the website. Your support is essential, and much appreciation to you myth makers who support this red pill cafeteria on a weekly basis. We're going to do so many wonders together. I just know it. Replace the tale told by the idiot God and finally make our own tale together. That signifies everything. We are not of one mind, but we now speak with one voice. Led us to the interview with Mark Gaffney on his book, Gnostic Secrets of the Nassines. 
and after the interview, some pleuromic music called Saturn Returns by a soundful and furious artist called Isaac Terentius Linder. The serpent was right all along. The Elohim were afraid of us because they knew we would be greater than them. Now we claim our rightful immortality by casting off these rags and skins that made us slaves to the establishment. Or like Ralph Walden Emerson said, a man is a god in ruins. When men are innocent, life shall be longer and shall pass into the immortal as gently as we awake from dreams. The levee is breaking, have no fear. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we definitely have the pleasure of having Mark Gaffney to discuss his book, Gnostic Secrets of the Nascenes, The Initiatory Teachings of the Last Supper. How are you doing today, Mark? Really happy to be with you, Miguel. Oh, it's definitely a great pleasure having you on as we discuss. Uh, I will never feel this show is complete that I've been doing for the last eight years unless we could finally get you on. And uh, I was very grateful for a listener to be able to track you down. So uh, tell us, Mark, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your journey and how you came to write this book? I mean, what is interesting is that obviously when thinking of Gnosticism, most people think of the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, maybe the secret book of Mark, uh, the, the church father's polemics, but you were able to found this amazing esoteric treasure trove in a somewhat uh, unknown psalm by some church father. How did this happen? Well, I, you know, I was, uh, I, I guess I felt a need to understand my own spiritual roots here in the West, and we, of course, uh, I was not satisfied with the answers that I had been given. You know, I was brought up Catholic, went to Catholic schools, and uh, I had already uh, delved into the Nag Hammadi Library when that was published in 1977, and I became familiar with those uh, scriptures uh, that had been thrown out. And uh, it was in the 90s when I stumbled upon this old uh, original source text buried in the refutation of all heresies, which was this tome put together by... Um, a bishop in Italy, his name was Hippolytus. He was the bishop of Portus, which is the, was the port city of Rome. And he took it upon himself to, uh, to expose the uh, heretics. And uh, there were many divergent uh, forms of Christianity and Gnosticism and, and, and paganism at that time. And uh, the church was at war with all of them. And... Uh, so he composed this 10-volume work, and in the fifth book, he embedded within it this source text from a, a sect of Gnostic Christians called the Nessenes. And it's not clear from the text, they don't explicitly say where they were based, but it's, you, know, you, can, you can pretty much conclude it was Alexandria because of the rich material uh, at that time, Alexandria was the most cosmopolitan city on earth, and it was a great learning center. Many of the Greek philosophers went there to study. There was the uh, Library of Alexandria, at that time the greatest uh, library on earth. And um, it was a, you know, a crossroads of various religions. Even Buddhists, uh, Buddhist monks turned up in Alexandria. And so it, you know, it was rich in ideas and traditions, and uh, they had the Hermetic tradition there, thousands of years of, Egy of Egyptian culture and religion, and many other, uh, many other uh, uh, religions also. So these Nessenes had, uh, you know, uh, had the access to all this information, all this material, and and this uh, this Nessene sermon, this source text. It disappeared for many centuries and was rediscovered in a Greek monastery of Athos in 1842, uh, an obscure you know, uh, re reproduction. It had been recopied re by some scribe you know, centuries before. But, and it was first published, I think, in 1858 or, or thereabouts. And 
did not really get the uh, attention it deserved for uh, until uh, I'd say the late 20th century. There were a couple of uh, papers uh, published about it. Still to this day, it's un- virtually unknown, and uh, and yet it offers unique insights into the early period of Christianity because of the uh, of what it tells us about the uh, the early Christian movement in Jerusalem. So that's kind of a thumbnail summary. So uh, what do we know exactly about the Nicenes themselves, Mark? Who were they? Again, they don't get the same press that the Valentinians or Sethians or others get. No, and uh, this is the only text we have. The only source is this uh, this uh, chapter, several chapters in Volume Five of uh, this uh, Bishop Hippolytus's uh, tome. And um, the you know the the bishops of the church uh, viewed Gnosticism and Gnostic ideas as heretical, and we've been told that uh, I mean just look it's look at any. Any study by you know, there's so many studies on Gnosticism, and they all say tell us that Gnosticism was a parasitical creature, you know, that lived off the uh, the, the Gospels and was derivative, you know, it came in the second and third centuries. But now we know just the opposite that uh, the the Nicenes uh, used the Gospel of Thomas. It's mentioned even in the text and in several passages in an amplified form. It's definitely Gnostic to the core, and the the, the scholars who studied the book of uh, the, the Gospel of Thomas, and this was the full first full text was uh, uncovered at Nag Hammadi in that, that Gnostic library that was discovered after World War II there in uh, along the Nile in Egypt, and that was near the site of the first Christian monastery, uh, and it was dated to 350 to 400 A.D., which was exactly the time when the uh, uh, the church began to re- uh, persecute the Gnostics. So it's not derivative. This was the conclusion of the scholars that studied it uh, that produced the uh, that first uh, compilation published in 1977. Uh, Helmut Kester was one of these scholars. Uh, Elaine Pagels was another. And uh, the, uh, the conclusion that this, this Gospel of Thomas was not derivative, that it actually preceded the Gospels, uh, is extremely important because... Thomas is Gnostic to the core, and uh, by Gnostic we mean it. Uh, this group uh, and this this text refers to uh, secret teachings and higher consciousness, basically higher consciousness, higher spiritual uh, teachings, which is anathema. You know, this is heretical in Christianity. Yes, and uh, like you say yourself in the book, uh, the psalm isn't written for people like you and I. For it was meant not for the general public, but those who had been initiated and high, had higher knowledge. And what about the uh, name Nassim? You, you mentioned that Hippolytus says it means serpent. Is he right or is he off? Well, I don't know. You know, I, I, it, I, it's really a, myster- a mystery. I don't understand. I don't think anybody really knows where that name came from. But there's no doubt that the uh, the sect uh, they venerated the serpent, and uh, you know this was, but it was imbued with spiritual uh, significance. You know, uh, the serpent, the snake, has many different levels of meaning. Uh, depend, depends on the context. If the bishop had really explored the all the scriptural citations, uh, many of them from the Old Testament that are embedded in this in this source text. He would have understood that the uh, this is not some pagan group. And, uh, Hippolytus concluded they were pagans, and uh, the early scholars who looked at the uh, sermon also agreed that it was pagan. But when you look at the deep structure of it, it's it's clearly not. The all the pagan material was simply appropriated, uh, and uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I I think that scholarship today agrees, and I'm not alone here, that this is that this group was not pagan. But the uh, paganism and many of the other uh, hermetic uh, references come came in because, as I said, of this rich tradition in Alexandria. And as you mentioned, it seems that the Nicenes didn't have such a hard view of reality or matter of life as other Gnostic groups like the Sethians did. Am I right to say this? Absolutely. They were not pessimistic. They viewed the... Uh, they were Christian. They were... they. If you if if asked, I'm sure they would have described themselves as disciples of Jesus, and uh, they believed that uh, the body was the temple, and that the spirit uh, was the light in the temple, and that this was to be cultivated, and they were rather optimistic. 
they were not pessimistic like some of the other uh, Gnostic groups. Exactly, and it's uh, very interesting, as you mentioned, about the pagan part. The the Nicene Psalm reminds me a lot of, for example, the the great declaration of Simon Magus, because as he's writing it, or who the author was, a scribe, he's bringing in all these pagan uh, Hellenistic uh, ideas. He brings in Homer and gods, and then, of course, he weaves it in with Genesis and so forth. Uh, was this some sort of uh, literary device that uh, these alternative Christians used in those days? Yes, well, I think the early scholars were misled by this. They assumed this was, that this was a pagan uh, document, but what the, the author of the uh, Nassim sermon was simply doing was appropriating all this other material for, a, for his purpose, which was to show that, that this principle of, and the, the, the great teaching of Jesus uh, that, uh, you know, uh, traces to the, to the Last Supper, uh, the teaching of eminence uh, was actually present into varying degrees in all these other traditions. You know, there's all there's evidence for it everywhere, because this teaching of eminence, it's just omnipresent. I mean, uh, all these other pagans and other teachers were simply witnesses to it. And by eminence, you mean that the divine is within us and all around us, and we just have to, as you say in your book, we have to remember, we just have to open our eyes to it. That's right. It's everywhere, and yet men do not see it. It's laid upon the earth, and yet we miss it. And this teaching of uh, really corresponds with the teaching of the immortality of the soul. And uh, you, you know, this uh, Jesus was not alone here. Uh, the uh, the Greek philosophers taught the same thing, Plato and Socrates, and the the great saints of India. But this was a new teaching and a new development in Ju- in Judaism, completely new. So there was no precedent for it in in, uh, in Judaism, and so it was it was revolutionary. And uh, this Nassim text is so important because it helps us to helps it confirms the gospels that the, that were found at Nag Hammadi. It's another confirmation of this Gnostic material, and that this Gnostic material was integral to Christianity. It didn't come later. And, you know, it's ironic because the, uh, these scholars that have told us that Gnostic, Gnosticism was derivative and was parasitical upon the Gospels are now really back into a corner because we have scholarship, new scholarship, that much of the historicity of the New Testament is not reliable. There's a book out a few years ago by Joseph Atwill, Caesar's Messiah, Another book by Rene Somme, The Myth of Nazareth, which uh, shows that there's no archaeological evidence for the, the town of Nazareth at the time of Jesus. And there is a challenge to the historical authenticity of Jesus uh, that uh, has some merit. You know, it's not, I don't agree with it totally, but there is some merit there. Some of this research is solid. and uh, But this tells us that the Gnostic material is really the most important of all. The Gnostic elements that are in the, the New Testament, there's a few of them there, and then these, these uh, Gnostic Gospels and this, uh, this Nassene Sermon from Alexandria are, very, are just more important than ever because they establish the, the reality of these spiritual teachings, which were not uh, something that the Romans cooked up. Exactly, and as you mentioned, Joe Atwell, he's been on the show, and so, and uh, other scholars. Well, I'd love like, to hear that interview. Oh yeah, I'd, I'd love to send you the link. Uh, no problem. But he's he was on the show, so it's been uh, Birger Pearson, uh, one of the translators of Nag Hammadi, and others, and they say that they believe that Gnosticism began or the movement began before Christianity, before Jesus, which goes against, let's say, Lane Pagels and Karen King, who think that it started with Jesus or a little bit. After. What is your view on the origins of Gnosticism, Mark? Well, I would agree with both of them, really. I, I mean, I think that Gnosticism was a movement that was that it was present to some degree, even in the pagan traditions. <clears throat> and I think there's evidence that even <clears throat> in the oldest Egyptian uh, Hermetic tradition, there was a there was a Gnostic element there. So I don't think you can. I mean, I, I would I would definitely I would argue that Jesus introduced this new teaching in Judaism. I don't think Gnosticism was present in Judaism before, but it, Gnosticism had, did have precedence, you know, and uh, there was a 
Gnostic tendency in many of the other religions of the day. But I don't think it reached its fullest expression until Jesus uh, uh, appeared. What about, as you mentioned, the Nicenes certainly believe in reincarnation, and they shared this with other Gnostics who were very uh, obvious about claiming this. But as you mentioned, this idea actually was in Christianity, wasn't it? The evidence is there in the New Testament in black and white for those who can see it. All you have to do is be able to read. To me, it's, it's just astounding that the uh, the Church passed over this material, uh, you know, just blindly passed over it for 2,000 years. Yeah, but it's there, in black and white. And I, I kind of compile the, that material in the first couple chapters of the book. Yeah, and you do an excellent job with that. And, uh, of course, you've got Origen, the work in the Gospel of John. So it was definitely up in the air. And uh, you're talking about how uh, Christianity or Judaism wasn't ready for it. But as you mentioned, did Judaism or Christianity as it evolved, was it ready ready for it because they decided that had enough with the tribal god uh, Yahweh? Is that one of the reasons they sort of evolved into a more Gnostic-minded movement? Well, if you go back and look at the Judaism over the, the, the millennium before Jesus, you can see a definite trend uh, away from the, uh, the shallow priestly traditions, you know, this priesthood that had existed and that had no spirituality at all. They were just going through the motions of religion with blood sacrifice, and there was a lot of politics involved. And in the last uh, four or five centuries B.C., you see the emergence of the uh, the wisdom books in the Old Testament, starting with Job. This was a psychoanalytic analysis of the uh, Hebrew God Yahweh, and it was really <laughs> subversive. Oh yeah, <laughs> very subversive book, Job. Very few people un- have understand it today. Modern Christians just don't get it, uh, and it exposed the f- the flaws in Yahweh and the fact that he was this uh, jealous uh, uh, storm god, basically. A, there's so much pagan material in Yahweh. What was missing was any inclusion or awareness of the Divine Mother. This was a wrathful patriarch, you know, this bearded old man, you know, in a white robe, and who commanded thunder and lightning, you know. In the last wisdom books, in the, the last books of the Old Testament were, were the wisdom literature where you have the first introduction of an awareness of the divine feminine. And uh, this culminated in, in Jesus, who, uh, who fulfilled this, this in, in, uh, with the teaching of eminence and the teaching of the Holy Spirit, which was directly uh you know linked to the divine mother i mean this is a form of grace that comes through through the feminine channel you have the full flowering of this of this what i call a reform movement uh that went on in the last centuries of uh, bc and you have the so you have the weakening of the priesthood tradition and you have the emergence of these other divergent sects like the essenes who were very unhappy with the, the priesthood and went off and did their own thing in the desert so it, the time was ripe. The moment was ripe for uh, for Jesus to appear on the scene. Yeah, and uh, again, you write a great chapter on the the book of Job and how he, and again, orthodoxy misses it, but he's the one who's victorious. He's the one who at the end of the book really wins because he becomes superior to God. And as uh, Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell said, Job has some sort of this uh, Prometheus sensibility, and in the end, God realizes that he has to become human in order to really be complete. Yes, the, the book of Job is fascinating, and uh, Carl Jung did a really masterful uh, analysis of it in his answer to Job, one of the great uh, biblical studies we have, uh, and uh, provided some invaluable insights. The Gnostic scribe of old also provided some insights. You know, like, for example, why would a jealous God, or why would a true God, a real God, be jealous? I mean, if there wasn't uh, something to be jealous of, then where does jealousy enter in? And, of course, the the insight is that, well, somehow this wrathful deity is, is lacking in something. And that that is the divine feminine, you know, the Sophia. Exactly. And as you point out in your book, Mark, uh, Gnostic Secrets of the Nessenes, there's a whole... 
uh, wisdom, uh, divine feminine in the Old Testament in several books like uh, uh, Proverbs and uh, and even uh, the Apocrypha had plenty of that. And, and something that you point out, which I thought was very astute, is even in the times of early Christianity, the, the gospel of the Hebrews, which we have lost, that itself says that the Holy Spirit is feminine, isn't it? That's right. I think there's a passage that was pr- preserved in the writings of St. Jerome, uh, where Jesus refers to the Divine Mother, how she lifted him up by the hairs of his head and, to, and took him up to Mount Tabor. A, a very explicit reference. That, but this was, you know, this was obliterated by the Church. And we should, we should mention that this, uh, this fruition, this awareness of the Divine Mother that was realized in the, in the person of Jesus and in the, in the Christian movement of the early years was all thrown out. The Church threw all of that out. And so today you don't have any awareness of the of this uh, of the, the significance of these wisdom books, uh, and you know it's just modern day Christians don't just don't get it. They don't understand the significance of it. And why do you think this is, Mark? Why? I mean, in ancient times, it didn't matter how oppressive uh, empire was; they had gods and goddesses. Where did this idea come that, or why this idea come of completely uh, expo- You know, getting rid of the divine part of God is it? Does it? Is that? Is the reason that it's easier to control people? Well, yes. I mean, in a, in a nutshell, yeah. When the church. And there really, in the early days, there was no church. It was not a church. It was a community. It was a movement uh, where you had uh, you had uh, equality between men and women, uh, gender equality. So you had many women teachers. Uh, and uh, in fact, one of the one of the teachers mentioned in the Nassine sermon, and and this was apparently a, a woman, a saint, who had come to Alexandria, Alexandria to impart these teachings. Her name was. Um, Miriam, and this may have been Mary Magdalene. It's very, it's very possible. We can't be sure, but there's no question from the, that from the the text of the Nassene sermon that she was a she was a, a very powerful sp- spiritual force. So uh, this uh, this was very threatening to a male power structure, to uh, the church hierarchy that emerged by the second century. And I think what we see here is the same thing that had, tends to happen to all spiritual movements. When they become institutionalized, they lose that, that spiritual essence. And uh, the, in the interests of strengthening the, uh, you know, the, the, the superstructure, you know, the, the institution itself, they threw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, when they threw out the, the teaching of the immortality of the soul, Basically, it was all over for Christianity from then on, and we, as we see, we we now have inherited a a bankrupt tradition in the West, uh, devoid of any spiritual content. And I think this is why. And Christianity never evolved a single step after uh, it never advanced by a single step after about the fourth century. And I think this is why we see that the world as it is today. You know, this just just one disaster after another. Just look around the world. Yes, uh, in plain sight. And somebody might ask, a listener might ask, what do you mean by the immortality of the soul? I mean, doesn't the Orthodox Christianity say that the soul is immortal? What do you mean by that? Well, no, they don't. And the average Catholic doesn't understand this. The Church threw out the, this teaching of the immortality of the soul, uh, and they adopted a, a, their own theory of the soul. They cooked up their, their own theory of the soul over the first few centuries, and it, this this trend, this d- development reached its culmination in the figure of St. Augustine with the uh, teaching of original sin. So the idea that the Church teaches, and you know, they're very quiet about this. They don't really make a big deal about this. They keep it quiet so the average Catholic can grow up. You can go to Catholic schools, you can go to Catholic Church all your life, and you never really hear about it because they, they don't talk about it. That the soul is created along with the body, and, you know, the only chance for immortality of the soul is, you know, in the, on the last day, the so-called resurrection of the dead, you know. And the, the church becomes the, the church actually supplanted the Divine Mother. And this is where we come up with Mother Church, Holy Mother Church. She is the bestower of grace and all good things and the, uh, the formula for salvation. So in order to get there, to, to have a chance at, uh, 
at heaven, you have to follow, you have to f- obey and believe. And this formula of, explains, you know, why the, 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 the dark history of the West, of our, you know, of our tradition. And as you mentioned, Augustine himself said that the doctrine of original sin wasn't biblical. He was just speculating, but then suddenly the church just built this whole uh, institution on his ideas. And uh, even the Trinity, it was these ideas that were out there, and the church decided they were going to, you know, uh, circle the wagons around it for some reason. That's right. And uh, there's no, absolutely no scriptural basis for the either one, not for the Trinity, and not for original sin, as Augustine himself acknowledged, and uh, and yet, you know, this is now taught. We were talking about the Council of Nicaea, and uh, it's very important to understand what this was all about. It it's not easy to understand at reading the usual histories, um, because Arius, all of his writings were burned. So you know, we only understand Arius through through the writings of his accusers. Uh, but Arius pointed out the flaw in the church's teaching of the soul, in other words, that the soul is created along with the body at conception. Uh, and the flaw was that, well, then Jesus' soul was also created at uh, conception, and uh, this was posed a huge problem because uh, it meant that, uh, yeah, how then do you explain the divinity of Jesus? So the Athanasius and the, and the reactionary forces uh, elements there at Ni- at the Council of Nicaea uh, uh, condemned uh, Arian Arius's ideas. Uh, they called it Arianism, and all of his writings were burned. And they, out of the Council of Nicaea, came this the teaching of the Trinity that that Jesus is equivalent to the Father, and because you couldn't leave out the Holy Spirit, they had to include that too. So it was a logical necessity to in, to create a new doctrine called the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, which has no scriptural foundation whatsoever. So what really was going on was, it was all about, is Jesus to be worshipped or is he to be emulated? Because Arius and the, and the, and they were, you know, he probably represented a majority of the people in the Christians in the world at that time. There was probably a strong majority that favored Arius. Because implicit in this idea that, uh, that Jesus was human was that he could, he was to be emulated. And the idea, you know, the immortality of the soul was crucial here. By contrast, the church's teaching in the, that the soul was created at, at birth and dies at death uh, ended up uh, separating, setting Jesus up on a pedestal with the Father. So it created a chasm between God and man and making it, you know, you can't emulate this. How do, you, how do ordinary Christians emulate Jesus if he is out of reach like that? So it was decisive, really. And, uh, and uh, this is why I believe that when the church threw out the, the teaching of immortality, the immortality of the soul, I mean, they condemned uh, themselves. I mean, Christianity was the, you know was for, foregone that that they would never be able to uh, progress spiritually, unfortunately. And this is in contrast with the traditions of India, you know, which have continued to to uh, to evolve and grow and and progress over the millennia, and that continues today. And before we get back to the psalm itself, do you see in your personal view the the further studies of the Nag Hammadi Library and alternative Christians? Do you see, is there hope for Christianity, things getting better? Well, okay, there's always hope because of this teaching of the, uh, of the indwelling of the divine. Uh, it always comes back. You I mean, you can't kill the truth. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you can't kill it. You can repress it but you can't destroy it. And this is why uh, we had this happen in the 12th century. Uh, you know, we had the Grail Movement in Europe, which was a, a, a reflowering, a reemergence of this teaching, again, uh, in a time when uh, the, the Christians were just hungry for it. And so, yeah, it keeps coming back again. Well, what happened uh, to the Grail Movement? What happened uh, to this flowering that happened, a renaissance that happened in Europe. You know, this is the time when they were putting up the cathedrals. Well, we had the Albigensian Crusade in southern France, where thousands, uh, probably millions of, of so-called heretics uh, were just 
slaughtered, and and we had the Inquisition. That's how the Church reacted. So it was a chilling, uh, it had a chilling effect on Christianity, and I and I don't think that in the and, you know then you had the Reformation, but they didn't go deep enough. You know, the Protestant Reformation didn't really address the deeper issues, the deeper problems, and so you have the same problems with the, with the uh, Protestant churches. And in your book, you deal with the issue of the Holy Grail and the cup. Uh, what exactly w- would you say is the Holy Grail, Mark? Well, you know, there is one train of thought that this is an actual chalice that is, you know, has been hidden in some castle in southern France that dates all the way back. But no, I think the meaning was spiritual. And um, it, it's really interesting the way, it's fascinating that when this Grail literature first appeared in Europe, it just swept across the continent in just about a couple of decades, and you had translations of these uh, the, uh, the this Grail literature in every single country of Europe. It just swept across the continent. It was a phenomenon, and the only way you can explain that is is that there was a deep spiritual need for this uh, teaching, and you know we have that today too. I mean, we've never been in a more dire time than right now. And and so you know I think that I think that these ideas have come back again in the form of these great Indian uh, swamis and the, that have gurus that have come to the West, starting with Paramahansa Yogananda uh, and Vivekananda and then Muktananda and Amma. There's a number of them, and um, I think that they are presenting these original Christian teachings again. And it's the same teachings that uh, you know that appeared in Palestine in the, in the person of Jesus in the first century, and uh, everyone today has access to this. So anybody who really wants it can has access to. It. We can only hope that this movement, uh, you know, can gain enough traction uh, in in uh, and fast enough that we can avoid uh, the um, terrible abyss that now we're we, we're staring right into it now uh, with. Syria, with uh, Ukraine, with what's going on in Gaza. This is a prelude to this, the kind of terrible future we face if we cannot, this time, get it right. And all these other attempts uh, at uh, trying to establish a, a real spiritual movement on the planet, they, they have come to grief, they've you know, gone, gone upon a reef. Maybe this time it won't happen that way. I would certainly agree with you. I mean, it seems uh, the the message of the Gnostics is uh, more important than ever, how we live in uh, illusionary times full of uh, demiurges and archons and like the Roman times with these strange wars that have no meaning except to divide and conquer us. So it seems, yeah, the Gnostics, would you say, the Gnostic message is more important than ever, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And, you know, we have implicit in this idea of Gnosticism is that the individual must take responsibility. Each indiv- each person must take responsibility to find the truth. And we live in a time and a day of propaganda, you know, where we're just being besieged uh, 24-7. There's a drumbeat on the TV, and uh, people have to, they have to shake free. They have to, they have to explore on their own to try to find out the truth, and that means putting forth the effort. That's why I don't have any patience with for these people who try to escape, you know, into some Eastern tradition. And some of the Indian traditions deny the world. They deny the reality of the world. There is an appeal there for people who, who, for some reason, they just can't deal with it. But I don't think that's not what Ahmad teaches. That's not what Muktananda taught either. But Mark, I guess the question would be this, and it sort of dovetails what you just said. When we look at India... Because unlike the Gnostics and other ancient Christianities, they were allowed to evolve and express themselves. We have a rich body of rituals and dogmas we can hold on to, you know, look inward. But from the Gnostic viewpoint, if somebody said, well, Mark, uh, does the Nessene Psalm give us any rituals? Do the Gnostics give any rituals? Or what would you say to them? Well, I have never been into ritual myself. And I know that uh, some people really find it important and helpful. And, I, and, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, for some people this is very important. And so I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to criticize rituals or that whole tr- trend, you know, or that whole uh, um, 
way of, of approaching religion and spirituality, but it really has no importance for me personally. That's all I can tell you. So you would just say it's the uh, what Carl Jung and the ancient Gnostics would say, uh, think and look inward and see reality for what it is. Certainly, and I think we have to be tolerant of other people pursuing their own spiritual path. There's many paths up the mountain, and I think we can, we should embrace all of them. You know, we should be tolerant of all of them. And uh, unfortunately, we don't see this with the Christians. You know, just before I came on the show, I was visited by the local uh, Jehovah Witnesses. They come by every so often, and, you know, it's always a one-way conversation. They're always imparting to me, and, you know, they never listen to what I say to them. So, you know, I'm I'm growing very weary of that. Oh, yeah, we all, yeah, we've all had those experiences, that's for sure. And going back to the psalm itself, the, what are some other themes that you have? One of the themes which you do a, a masterful job is is the idea of the primal man or the son of man that the Nassines and other uh, Gnostics talk about. And again, going back to our conversation, something that modern Christianity really has no idea about. Well, this is, the document is incredibly rich. I mean, this source text and this is also why it is so difficult to understand. It's just crammed with material from the ancient world, including many, many uh, references to this idea of the primal man or the anthropos. There were many names for him. Uh, the uh, heavenly Adam, that's another one. Adamas, there were various names for him. And, you know, this was all lost. You never find any of this uh, in Christianity. Uh, when they threw out all the pagan material... They threw out a lot of the connections with the ancient world, and Christianity did not happen in a vacuum. I mean, there were, you know, it is rooted in all these other traditions, and that is why this document is so important. One of the reasons it's so important, uh, and I think that, uh, for example, this heavenly Adam, uh, the heavenly man, primal man, helps us to understand the significance of, of this preferred expression that Jesus used in reference to himself, the Son of Man. Uh, otherwise, this it's almost inexplicable, you know. And I, I think Christians uh, just pass over this phrase "son of man" uh, without having, without no appreciation of what of its importance. And I think even like Joseph Atwell, in his book, he should have gone into the background here on this, uh, but he did not, and I think he mis misinterpreted. But this was a very ancient expression. I tracked it back to, uh, and and I, and this is in contrast with the, with the name Messiah, Christ which is the usual name, but it was not the preferred name. Uh, the, in Peter's confession, uh, I, you know, this is a very important uh, and probably real authentic uh, part of the Bible, of the New Testament, that, uh, in which Jesus makes it very clear that the Son of Man is the preferred expression. And at, very, at just very best, he tolerated being called the Messiah, but the Messiah was really a very materialistic and political name. I mean, it, and it was not old. It was rooted in the prophetic books, reached its fullest expression uh, just a couple centuries before Jesus, and it was very heavily political. The Messiah was to be uh, a leader, a great military leader, and uh, this is in sharp contrast with uh, the Son of Man, which... Uh, we the origins are still unknown. I tracked it back to the period of exile, uh, the books that came out of that time, uh, like for example Ezekiel, uh, you know, include this name, the Son of Man. Uh, probably goes back to ancient Persia, and I really wonder if it may have originated in India, but I, I don't know. It's just speculation. But there's no question it was ancient, and it was, and it was imbued with all kinds of spiritual meaning. And the, the Book of Enoch is really good because it offers a summary of this, and this is, in, this is discussed in my book, so I'd refer to anybody who's curious, I'd, I'd advise them to go there. But it's very important to understand it and the contrast with, the, with Messiah or, or Christ. Yes, as you mentioned, it's, it's the primordial template where the idea of humanity comes from. And uh, and again, you mentioned the Book of Enoch, how important it is. And also another theme from the Nassim Psalm that you uh, expand on is the idea of water and the waters flowing back and the, the River Jordan. Could you tell us a bit about that, Mark? This is the thing that, that just initially grabbed my uh, eye when I uh, first read the uh, Nassim Sermon, when I first saw it. That's what leaped out, out at me right at the beginning. 
And that's when I knew that this document was very, very important. Uh, and it took me years, you know, of further study before I began to, you know, unravel it. Uh, because it's so dense with material uh, that's unfamiliar to modern readers. I mean, you know, this is like a compendium of ideas from the ancient world. And uh, it's not easy to understand, but it's certainly worth the effort to try try to uh, understand it. But the <clears throat> this idea of the Jordan, and, <clears throat> you know, you have, you go back to, this goes back to the, uh, the, the first crossing over the Red Sea where the waters part, and then you have this uh, happening again in the book of Joshua, where Joshua leads the tribe across the Jordan, and the waters part again. And you have the same thing repeating a second, a third, and fourth time in the book of Kings, where you know uh, Elijah crosses over the Jordan, and, and the waters part again, and then his disciple Elisha parts the waters. So when you have this kind of repetition, you know that this theme is very, very important. And again, what is so surprising to me and disappointing is that Christian scholars and theologians just pass over this material. And they pass over it for thousands a year, a couple thousand years. It's so very important. Uh, it, it's, it also helps us to establish the connection and the common ground with India, the teachings of India, the spiritual traditions of India. Because it, I think we have reference here. Uh, and this was the Nassim interpretation. Uh, this is the Nassim understanding that Jesus made the water flow backwards, and the Jordan River represents the spiritual channel, you know, back up the spine. So the downward flow is the material uh, expression of the world. The upward flow, the reversal of flow, would be the spiritual process where you go back to the source. Uh, so these are just simple ideas, just so simple, and yet the Christian theologians and, and scholars have passed over this material for 2,000 years. You really have to wonder. I mean, that's a real accomplishment, just just that alone. <laughs> <You know? laughs> hidden in plain sight. Huh? <laughs> yeah, hidden in plain sight. Uh, but again, I think that uh, that might have continued had it not been for the uh, the uh, these gurus, swamis, coming from India. It was Yogananda who pointed out some of these connections in his book, Autobiography of a Yogi. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just... Maybe it took an Easterner to uh, wake us up. Yeah, <laughs> right there. So you definitely see a lot of parallels between ancient Christianity and Hinduism. Absolutely. And although I don't talk about it in the book because other, other people have written about it, I didn't feel a need to go there, but I would not be surprised in the least if, uh, if the lost years were spent in Tibet and India. Uh, I think there's substantial amount of uh, evidence enough to, you know, maybe I'd call it compelling that that, that that it did happen. And so Jesus uh, apparently was known in Tibet and India as Isa, and uh, he he may well have spent those lost years, uh, you know, on a pilgrimage to the East. And even then, Mark, uh, we do know that the East and West were in wide contact in the ancient times. It's not like we've led to believe that the two never met. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, there Certainly there was evidence that uh, Buddhist monks were uh, present in Alexandria, so yeah, there was uh, there was a mixing of, of ideas even then, but uh, and there was probably trade, a certain amount of trade. There was a Silk Road, you know, but that connected Phoenicia, the co the uh, port cities there, Tyre and Sidon, that went across the desert all the way across uh, Persia to the uh, to China, you know, where there was trade. That's that was really ancient. In fact, the Hebrews originated as donkey drivers, so they were probably involved in that. They were uh, migrants, you know, initially, and then finally settled in what is now Palestine. And to end, Mark, uh, your book, is, and I mentioned this on the show, is uh, very much foundational in learning about uh, Gnosticism and uh, ancient Christianity. And uh, since your book was published, is there anything that you've had to change your views on or any new scholarship that might have bolstered what you've uh, researched? Well, um, you know, I'm. What makes so satisfying when I go back and look at it, there. Uh, I wouldn't change anything except one chapter. If I had to do it again, the chapter that would be different would be that chapter on the primordial waters. Uh, but the rest of it, no, I've, it's held up very well. I, a couple, there were a couple of mistakes, but you know that's going to happen. But um, 
overall, it it's withstood the test of time. Uh, the chapter on the primordial waters, however, <clears throat> I would have done very differently if I had to do it now. It can stand as a moment in time, as a moment of you know a, a, a process of research. So it can stand on that basis. Uh, but if I had to do it again, uh, I would I would do that very differently because after after my book went to press later, I, I discovered that uh, a scientist by the name of Paul Lavalette, he's an astrophysicist, he's the uh, director of the Starburst Foundation, incredible genius, and uh, he basically broke the code of the primordial waters, and. Uh, I refer to him as a modern-day Champollion. Wow. Yeah, very important uh, research that he did. And, you know, he didn't come around to understand this. And I'm now, I'm now talking about the traditions of uh, Egypt, the Hermetic tradition, the Osiris and Isis myth, uh, which is right at the core of this whole idea of primordial waters. Uh, because this really was not religion. And, you know, when you go back and look at the, read these old, these ancient, Egyptian texts, you know, Wallace Budge's translations and so on. It's just so strange, you know, it is so weird. How do you make any sense of this? Because there's no connection with, no obvious connection anyway that I ever found with, uh, you know, any of the modern spiritual traditions. But uh, Paul Lavalette explains that uh, the the Osiris and Isis myth was never not about religion. These were scientific ideas that were laid down in a symbolic form. And he, in fact, he only made this breakthrough after he created a whole new field of physics, which he calls subquantum kinetics, which is incredibly fascinating. But, uh, yeah, so we know that the ancient Egyptians had a very advanced understanding of astronomy, and we know that because of the research done at Na- uh, uh, by uh, Thomas Brophy, uh, who discovered? Uh, you know, he was he was a among a group of of scientists who who explored a site in southern Egypt. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the name of it. Nabta Playa. Now it's a, just a, a desert. You know, there's nothing there, nothing within a hundred miles of the place. But thousands of years ago, it was a fertile plain, and the the inhabitants, these ancient Egyptians, planted these giant megaliths all of which were aligned with incredible accuracy to the stars. And uh, so there's no question they had a very advanced astronomy. Well, according to Lavalette's work uh, on uh, uh, Isis and Osiris, we now know that they also had a very advanced understanding of physics. So put that together and you have some very serious questions that have never (laughs) been answered about where they got this knowledge. So I think that when you come down to it, the, the bottom line is that human origins are very murky. And, you know, this is really what I would love to get into. Uh, I would love to explore this whole area, uh, try to understand our origins, because it's really, the, these are the most interesting questions. However, you know, we're, uh, now, we're now looking into an abyss here on the planet, and uh, we have more pressing concerns at the moment. <laughs> staving off extinction so we can't worry too much about our origins and i agree with you and i agree with everything you said and uh again i really have always enjoyed your book but i think that's all the time we have today mark i'd like to thank you very much for coming on am bite and discussing your book gnostic secrets of the nascenes my pleasure miguel it's been fun